I wanted to start uh, with you this morning, basically, where I woke up and I couldn't find my glasses. So I kind of lost my vision. And here I was going for a visions talk, and I literally <laughs> felt, you know, this, this, is, this is problematic. You know? So I, I sort of got started panic, panicking a little bit. I tried to trace my, my steps yesterday night. I looked in the kitchen, I looked in the bedroom, I looked in the bathroom. I remember taking a shower, it was pretty hot last night no glasses you know i went to do some shopping and i thought i need to really use this for my talk today you know <laughs> my vision talk without vision you know there's something around that i came back and i kept on looking and i kept on looking and finally behind this leather couch i have in the kitchen were my glasses and I, and I thought well what does this mean what does it mean when you actually can't find something and it suddenly appears for me the significance of this of that little anecdote was in fact that it was a moment of procrastination. I came back home and, and simply needed to lie down and put my glasses down. They fell behind the couch and I wasn't thinking. It was, the vision was in a sense gone. It wasn't the, 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 the act of seeing, it was the act of having a vision that goes beyond. You know? uh, and that was actually important for me also because it touches upon, I think, what this workshop here is about or this exchange. It's about looking beyond. It's about having vision beyond asymmetries and it's something that's very dear to me in, in some of the work that we've been doing, and I would say co-creating also with colleagues around the world in relation to critiquing and rethinking how to do heritage conservation, protection and management and all these things. Now, before I get to that, um, I wanted to go even further back. A couple of decades ago, I want to you know, join me uh, in central Vietnam on a small boat uh, in Sun Trap village uh, and, and uh, a lady basically taking us out to this wonderful cave system uh, and I'm sitting on this boat and I've probably spent let's say two or three months at this time in this area and I fell in love with the place, I fell in love with the people, uh, an area of fantastic biodiversity and cultural diversity uh, but also an area which during the, the war was, was bombarded. It was the entry point to uh, the Ho Chi Minh trail system got bombed in, in so many ways, people had to flee, people died, everyone I spoke to had, had very tough memories. Uh, after the war, many people lived in fact of actually going to, to, to find metal scrap and resell it, uh, and of course suffered injuries and so on. So this was you know, a pretty tough place to come to. I had trouble sleeping actually, and people quickly explained it to me, well, you're not sleeping, Peter, because this is a haunted place as well. A lot of suffering, a lot of souls that haven't been taken care of. Uh, and all this, of course, I, you know, reminded me of stuff I'd read in anthropology, but now it suddenly made a different sense. So there I was, and one day on this boat trip, uh, rich, rich experiences with people, friendships were being established. Um, a gentleman from an international organization had come to the area and was looking at whether this area potentially could become a World Heritage Site. Uh, as an anthropologist, I immediately started telling him about you know, the richness of the history, uh, the culture of the area, the ethnic minorities who live there, uh, representing, among others, a very sort of uh, small in numbers, hunter-gatherer groups, uh, people that uh, have a very close and intimate relationship with the forest, karst forest environment in the area with the cave systems. And he basically said, you know, Peter, it's, it's, it's lovely to hear about all that, but I'm not here to look at that. For us, this area is really important, it's significant, because of the karst limestone complex. It's geologically important, and it probably is, but you can still, you know, I, I, I'm not able to tell you other than, than it probably is. What I want to say with that is I realized that in some respects, whatever I thought was important as heritage, in fact, wasn't important from, from a certain global perspective. Anyway, I kind of left it there and thought this guy probably had a screw loose or, or you know, he just didn't get it. Uh, and I kind of forgot about it. Continued my work. I was working for a conservation organization back then, trying to support uh, collaboration between villages and, and local forest management authorities, co-management. There was a whole paradigm about this, supporting co-management, local ownership. 
and so on. And I forgot about heritage, you know. Let's, let's support. And every, there was lots of dialogues going on. Um, but essentially, as years moved by, the area got uh, recognized as a World Heritage Site, and it led also fundamentally to the cementing of an exclusion of, of the indigenous peoples who had lived in this area for centuries. And, and for me, it was, it was also a social, it was a social drama, but it was also a personal drama to see that people, in fact, who live in these areas find themselves excluded from something called heritage. Uh, heritage, which for me till then, was really something very positive. You know, I thought it was important to have things that recognize culture, that recognize heritage. We live in a heritage era. We live in a heritage era where countries, governments are so convinced and constantly promoting for conscription of this or that site, of places, of objects, of, of groups, and so on. And at the same time, all these heritage processes um, could apparently lead to displacement, could lead to exclusion. Uh, at the very moment, uh, governments would be heralding this as, as, as progress, as being able to show how, how much effort was being done, it was doing the exact opposite with other layers, with other people. So here, here indeed, you know, is something really important for me in terms of asymmetries, of course. Asymmetries of voice, asymmetries of power, asymmetry, asymmetries of representation, asymmetries of heritage. But of course then, and this is where I get back to my glasses, because in a sense, uh, I've been a bit, for now, I guess for the last decade at least, uh, trying to engage with this, you know, getting heritage people in discussion with other heritage people to say, let's get our critical glasses back on again. We've been procrastinating too much on, on this leather couch and happy with celebrating heritage and the champagne and the inscription and all that, and not been really critical enough about what this means for people who live in the area, what it means for contested heritage, dissonance, and all these things. So that, that, that's been a big thing. Um, and I would say, not just in this area in Vietnam, but, but in so many other places, no? So what it meant was that I, I needed personally to also go back to, to academia a bit, uh, to actually get those critical uh, glasses back on and figure out some, some concepts as well you know, some readings that could enable me to better understand what was going on. And it moved on step by step by step. I wanted to show you some things, and it's very much been a social process. And that's why I was so inspired also by, by the previous speakers, um, showing that a lot of what we do comes out of actually engagement with many in community or in humanity, a unity as you say, or not necessarily. Uh, but, but in fact, having that conversation with many people involved is extremely inspiring. So, in the critical literature, what I found were, were, were many authors, colleagues from different universities, critiquing all this heritage, you know, displacement, um, um, hegemony, uh, lots of, of interesting words, good concepts, and so on. And at the same time, I found increasing frustration with some of my practitioner colleagues who work on natural and cultural heritage feeling, oops, are we on the wrong side, of, uh, you know, on the wrong team here? I, we thought we were doing good and suddenly we find ourselves being, being called hegemonic, neo-colonial and all this. What's going on here, Peter? Help us out. No? I mean, literally, one environmental organization reached out and said, Peter, you know, they met us in the airport with big banners saying, get out, get go, go home, kind of stuff. You know, what's going on? So, so we, we did this whole analysis work together to actually try to figure out what the issues were. And we found uh, a number of things, not just the same kind of site level stuff going on, but also systems, knowledge production systems, global management systems, policy documents that kind of sort of, what's the word, beating around the bush? are not really addressing, you know, that we live in a world of inequalities, that we live in a world of asymmetries, that we have rights that are being violated, you know? And that's where I, I increasingly also got back to this fundamental experience that despite this, this era of heritage, you know, where all these places, all these objects, all these practices, rituals, ceremonies are being recognized as heritage, at the same time, we have people that are persecuted for their cultural identities. We have languages that are being banned. 
uh, how many languages are lost every minute. I don't remember. There are statistics on this. We have uh, so many spaces that are being polarized. And as, as you were saying, there's the refugee day coming up. And we have, of course, so many refugees that are refugees because of their cultural identities. So where is all this heritage, identity, and all this work heading, you know? So with a number of people, I think there's been a growing movement uh, to really say, can we actually shift the balance? Can we kind of take that heritage discourse that in some ways has been taken over by nationalist sentiment, and in some ways even propaganda, uh, that many, in many times have been taken over by corporate sector as well, fantastic to commodify heritage, whatnot, uh, that somehow has ended up in a very sort of neutral language that disguises disagreement and so on, and dissonance, and move that to something that's more grounded, you know, that recognizes that we, we, are, we have different perspectives on this, that, that there are long-standing legacies of exclusion, there's a sentiment very often, you know, disgruntled people, people that feel displaced, and indeed transform. And here comes my vision bit, no? And then thank you indeed for encouraging me to think visionary, although I found it to be such a big word that I was like, oh my God, you know, like, even to the point that when I, when I walked my dog this morning, uh, a friend in the park said, oh God, visionary talk, you know, what's this, you know? But, 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 but there's something to it, and the vision there is about how do we actually recuperate, recuperate that heritage space, you know? How do we take it away from nationalist agendas? How do we take it away from, from, from corporate uh, co-optation? How do we actually, and, and, and give it back to, you know, where people are living, and coexisting and living with histories of conflict as well, and so on, and indeed mobilize heritage as tools of reconciliation, as tools of mediation, uh, and so on. So that, that's a big project, and we're many people that are involved in it, with colleagues from, from different continents. Uh, we've collaborated on something that started in Norway, but it's been taken to different continents, called Our Common Dignity, which was around sort of heritage and, and dignity issues. Um, Monday, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, in the, in the Human Rights Council, we had a whole debate around the issue of cultural rights. Where one of the points I tried to make with, with the Human Rights Council was the importance of, of taking that issue of saying, you know, oh my God, the destruction, the target of destruction in the Middle East and so on, it's terrible, it's a human rights violation. Yes, but it's not the only issue. And, and how to take that away only from a very material dimension and connect that heritage work with the profound issues of cultural identity, uh, discrimination, racism, polarization that our world is experiencing. We need to get back to that to humanize. And I'm, I'm, I'm making a wink here to our students. We had a, an engagement workshop in uh, Ticino last week, and, and one of the key words that came from our students, Swiss anthropology students, was we want to humanize anthropology. No, we want to get back to that sort of level. And I think we need to humanize heritage as well again. It's been sort of taken away, it's become something that's a bit of an industrial thing, and not just somewhere out there, also here, no? A few years ago we did work in, 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 uh, in Switzerland on sustainability and heritage. I spoke to winemakers in Lavaux, I spoke to people in Bern even, you know, about how do you live in, in a World Heritage Site, and there's, there's so much to be said there. But my vision is that, how to move from heritage as rejection of rights to one of reconciliation, uh, how to move from heritage as uh, protecting uh, strong interests towards one of inclusion. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, as you can obviously see, and many people are already engaged in. Um, Timing-wise, I would say that maybe I'd just like you to, to listen to a, a few uh, words from from uh, Bakro, who uh, is an Arem elder in in um, in Phang Nha Ke Ban in in Vietnam. So this World Heritage site, uh, as soon as it became World Heritage, it's become a fantastic source of income for for the province. It's heralded. It's there's an amazing commitment. At the same time, tourism companies have moved in. A lot of the caves uh, have been basically become sites now of exclusion. So, in fact, years of work that we were trying to actually try to get commitment to actually uh, recognize customary use. 
uh, were actually kind of failed <laughs> and were replaced by, by new tourism ventures. So, so you know, there's sort of a whole shift of a meaning and cohabitation. But I still think it's important to also acknowledge the voice of, of customary stewards in these situations, even though perhaps our, our transformative hopes aren't necessarily as transformative uh, in, in the end, or it may take longer than we want to, it's important to raise those voices. So, so I, I, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to speed track you into basically what, what we did was um, uh, we went with back row on, on a walk into to these caves to, to revisit them after basically just a year or two after uh, that they had had the official stamp of not being able to to go in there anymore and just you know so just, just to give you a sense of this uh, I, I wanted to share that with you as, as a way of kind of ending the talk so yeah there we are thank you very much and um, let's, let's